Welcome back to The Breakfast and of course uh, you're still live on PLOS TV Africa. It's time for Today in History and we're going to be sharing with you things that happened today many, many years ago. It is one of the most shocking incidents in Nigeria's history and this happened in 2013, a massacre in Baga. Um, and of course, uh, this is one of those uh, uh, moments that in Nigeria's history that a lot of people have repeatedly said we hope it never real cause. It brings back the conversation on insecurity, brings back the conversation on our fight against terrorism and how far we've really been able to go um, in our fight against um, uh, terrorism. Um, so I'm going to quickly also share uh, uh, with you uh, what happened on this day in 2013 in Baga. The Baga massacre began on the 16th of April in a village of Baga in Borno State. As many as 200 Civilians were killed, hundreds were wounded, and over 2,000 houses and businesses worth millions of naira were destroyed. Refugees, civilian officials, and human rights organizations accused the Nigerian military of carrying out the massacre. According to residents, soldiers returned with reinforcements supported by armored vehicles. Soldiers then allegedly doused homes in Baga with gasoline and set fire to the village, shooting villagers who attempted to flee. Some attempted to escape into Lake Chad and drowned there, while others were able to escape into the surrounding bushes. According to residents, the soldiers continued burning homes in Baga until the 17th of April. Brigadier General Austin Edupai stated that only six civilians and one soldier um, were, were, were killed, while the armies uh, killed 30 Boko Haram terrorists. Casualties were reported to be especially high among children and the elderly. And by the 17th of April, 193 wounded victims had been admitted to a local health clinic. Uh, Baga apparently is a small fishing town um, um, of the, um, on the banks of the Lake Chad, near the borders of Chad and Niger Republic. Um, so I started with talking about you know, our fight against insecurity um, and the fight against insurgency and, and some of all of that. Um, but in the middle of this conversation, you know, and when we talk about insecurity and what the Nigerian government has been able to do to rid the country of insurgents, um, there's also been, you know, the conversation about human rights abuse and um, 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 going, you know, against um, uh, the rules of engagement. There's also been conversations on um, extrajudicial killings by the Nigerian army and by um, our security agencies. Mm -hmm. Amnesty International has pointed this out multiple times. Um, there's also been times when, uh, you know, it is rumored that, you know, the, that foreign um, countries refuse to sell arms to the Nigerian government. Remember during good luck uh, Jonathan's administration because of human rights abuses and of course the high-handedness of the Nigerian army. Sadly, um, we've never really had a thorough investigation on any of all these incidents. Baga is one that happened in Borno State, if you remember also in Zaria, mm -hmm. um, uh, the Shiite massacre as it is popularly called, where there's, you know, it's a rumor that about 500, 347 are the official figures, but um, Amnesty International and other um, you know, uh, persons have stated that it's way more than that. There's still not been any proper investigation into um, some of all those killings. Um, nobody has been fired or arrested. Nobody has been made to, um, uh, has been held um, um, to account for the killing of Nigerian citizens in that um, 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 number. Mm -hmm. Ran in 2015, I think it was in January, there was a misfire, according to Nigerian Air Force, that killed about 150 Nigerians um, in, in an IDP, IDP camp. camp yeah. um, still nobody was sacked or fired. Nobody um, has been held you know, accountable. Two weeks ago, um, I was speaking on, the, on this you know, platform and I was asking, what is the value of the Nigerian life? Um, in our moves to either protect ourselves or to just live as a society, what truly is the value of a Nigerian life? And who gets to be held uh, you know, uh, to account, account yeah. when a Nigerian life is taken by insurgents or by security agencies? Um, lately, we've also had conversations about what happened in Bainwe State. There's reports by um, um, NGOs and people on the ground in Bainwe that said the army, this is two, three weeks ago or two weeks ago? Yeah, not too um, long ago maybe less than two weeks ago, the army stormed Benue State after the death of about 12 soldiers and, you know, there's reports about 70 people or maybe 100 people that were killed in that um, incident. Who, you know, gets to take responsibility or who gets to be asked questions? Why does the Nigerian government almost seemingly make the Nigerian life seem so valueless? Um, yeah. You can go all the way back to Odi, during Olshiko Basunjo's uh, government. You can go all the way back to um, um, there's, there's some other one. Um, that happened during Obasanjo's um, um, rule uh, or as president. So it's, it's not the first time. 
it's, it's been, been many, many times that it has happened. And it's painful to see that Nigerians would flee from terrorists, flee from bandits, flee from kidnappers, flee from armed headsmen, and still flee from their own security agencies. It is hurtful and it is really, really sad. It's traumatic. Yes, it is. And it brings me back to what you said earlier on, uh, that people should be shameful. When things go wrong, they should be shamed, right? But I also want to draw attention to what happened in Benue State. It is hydra-headed. There were deaths on both sides. The army, security agents, they died. And then civilians died. Yeah. And then uh, they are placing the blame at the doorstep of bandits. And so it just means we need, we need to get things right in Nigeria, security-wise. Our criminal justice system, our policing system, our security system has failed to be able to make um, proper investigations, carry out intelligence you know, uh, reports in order to fish out the perpetrators of certain crimes. It is terrible to hear that um, um, Nigerian army you know, personnel, soldiers are killed yep. by anybody, whoever the person is, terrorist, civilian, whoever you are. Bandits. And those people should be made to pay for the death of those soldiers. True without even you know thinking twice about it yeah. but it doesn't in any way excuse the army storming a community no, or storming doesn't. a village um, and allegedly attacking everybody and blaming them you know for the death of those soldiers and so um regardless of who is to blame it is also generally it is a failure of a system mm -hmm. to pick out the perpetrators of certain crimes. I agree. It is a failure of a system to be able to ensure proper investigation into certain crimes. Mm -hmm. So instead, what we do is bring a sledgehammer, go into a village and bang it on an ant. That doesn't solve the problem. All right, let's do an about turn, right? We'll leave Nigeria for some time. Yeah. Let's uh, talk about Kendrick Lamar, who became the first rapper to win the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, on the 16th of April 2018, the Pulitzer Prize Board awards the Pulitzer Prize for Music to rapper Kendrick Lamar of his, uh, for his 2017 album, Damn. It was the first time the award had gone to a musical work outside the genre of classical music and jazz. Lamar grew up in a community with a singular connection to this genre. And plenty of Lamar's lyrics referenced police brutality, systemic racism, and other political topics, but many critics have praised his albums. Now, the Pulitzer Committee called Damn, the album we're talking about now, a, a virtue six song collection unified by its vernacular authenticity and rhythmic dynamism. That's a mouthful. Well, they said it offers affecting, you know, and captivating and very complex modern African American life attraction. You know, Lamar Swin was widely seen as a deserved recognition of his talent as well as an overdue acknowledgement of hip hop's contributions to American culture. Lamar became known for the social commentary in his music. You know, this this thing about Lamar's music will be so relevant now in the US where you have so much racial tension. Mm -hmm. There's one going on right now about Dante. Yeah, Dante Wright, I believe. Yes, Dante Wright. And then there's the one about George Floyd. I mean, the uh, what's it called? Hearings are ongoing as we speak right now. Yeah. So, so Lamar comes to the limelight as we speak. Well, he, he does, you know, but, um, you know, it, it's always been, you know, over time, there's always been, um, you know, persons in the American music industry, black American music industry, who've, or African American rather, who have, um, you know, used their music as a platform to speak against um, injustice here and there. Um, and they've never held back, you know, because they live in a society where, you know, you can, you can speak your truth and, you know, no record label is going to kick you out or government's not going to, you know, accuse arrest you of, of, um, of breaking COVID-19 guidelines and, you know, and arrest you. So there is that, you know, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's also, you know, the, the conversation this morning is really to give kudos to a prolific writer and rapper um, who has, you know, been able to, you know, express his talent in a very, very phenomenal way. Mm -hmm. um, he has been rated many times as one of the best rappers in the world, Kendrick Lamar, um, um, along with the greats, you know, mm -hmm. even in his time, you know, so if, if you can put him in, you know, in the same breath as, 
you know, the likes of NAS and, and uh, Tupac and B.I.G. and, and uh, K.R.S.One and some mm. of all those great lyricists, then he has done phenomenally well. In a way, he shattered the glass ceiling in terms of the Pulitzer Prize. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Mm. All right. That's what we have for you today in history. And um, we're moving into our first major conversation for today, which comes up next. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Consumer Price Index and, of course, uh, stating uh, well, uh, conversations about the inflation we're currently dealing with. 22.95% uh, food inflation. How are Nigerians coping? What does this really mean to the common Nigerian? What does this mean to everybody who might be affected? We get into that conversation after this short break. Stay with us. <laughs> 